All right, so probably last lecture. This is hello. Okay. So we are on section 14.3, which is what should managers control, and. The first subsection I already mentioned last time, I actually covered in detail is when and it had the feed forward control, the concurrent control and the feedback control. And now this section is what areas managers should control. And uh, we are covering only two major areas. One is finance and the other area is information. Within finance we have two methods or two approaches or we can even call it two strategies or two control systems. The first one is what I covered last time and where I finished last time with financial ratios and you're expected to know what's a liquidity ratio or liquidity ratios, leverage ratios, acidity ratios and profitability ratios okay so one is called ratio analysis and the other type of analysis is called budget analysis so first we need to say what is a budget and budget is simply a financial plan a budget is your is a forecast of your future financial statements. It is a forecast of your future revenues, of your future expenses, of your future profits, and possibly your future balance sheets. So this is what a budget is. Basically a budget provides for what can you spend. So the focus of budget is usually associated with what we call cost control. Business, if it does not control costs, can easily get in trouble. So a budget will provide costs for workers, for labor, costs for electricity, for internet, for water, all sorts of costs for healthcare, for medical, for retirement, and an important part of control is to stay within your plan budget. Well, of course, that also means separately to stay within your... Uh, maybe you have to separate, okay? Next time you separate, okay? All right, I'm trying to tell you about budgets, okay? So, cost control is an important part. And then we get to budget analysis. And budget analysis is a comparison of your forecast budget with your current actual expenses and revenue, with your current actual budget, and trying to see where you have differences, where you have deviations, and attempt to take corrective action. All right. So you want to see, are you overspending? Where are you overspending? And why are you overspending? And then of course the question is, how can you fix it? How can you lower costs? Okay. So that's basically budget analysis. So that's the first major area is called finance. Now we get to the second major area, which is information. And today, information is uh, critical, especially for things like identity theft. You may have a bank, and some, you know the bank will have customers, and someone will try to steal a customer's identity and go and take the money out from the bank. Okay. So that's a simple way. Uh, or they can try and take the debit card number or the credit card number and try to charge the debit or the credit card, try to run some expenses. Or you basically, or they basically try to steal the card and use it maybe to do purchases. 
buy refrigerator, buy TV, buy whatever. Of course, with a fake identity, so when they say, well, somebody came here and you can't see who that person might be, okay? Well, now we got cameras, so when the purchase was made on, let's say, 13 hours, 52 minutes, and 25 seconds, the camera will show you on that second who's been at the cash register. But obviously, just some face of a bearded guy, you can't recognize him a lot. So, identity theft is a big, big problem. Another type of information which uh, businesses would like to protect is the information of their customers. Who are their customers? Especially regular, repeat customers. Whether it's a major distributor, whether it's a pharmacy, doesn't matter what's the type of business. Yeah, why not a hotel? A hotel may have a customer list of some of the better customers which come every year to vacation, okay? Well, a competitor can steal your customers and then advertise to them and try to first steal the list of the customers and then steal the customers themselves by getting the revenue from them so that you're effectively losing your customers. So you may have what we may call a customer theft. Okay? Let's see what else we got. So if you want to have an information control, again, you need what's called an information system. So most businesses today will have an information system. And it's known in business as MIS, Management Information Systems. And a management information system will have information about accounting and all your accounting information will be there. It will have information about sales, about customers, about products, okay? So it will have a lot or most of your critical information as a business will be in the management information system. Now, the, what the management information system is, the main idea is to provide information. That's why it's called management information system. And you need to make a difference between information and data. Data would simply be numbers and observations, or it's going to be a number about something. Okay? So a data is you spend, let's say, 25 baht and you spend 2,000 baht. Information will be something more of a summary of data something which you can actually use to know a lot, okay? Something that gives you more than just a simple piece of data, okay? And information is something that you can use to usually rely to make decisions. So data is associated with a particular observation. In particular observation might be Good or not good, representative or not representative, might be good to make a decision or not make a decision. Okay? For example, uh, let's try this. Uh, you're taking a course and you got, let's say, uh, one point, one point on your quiz. One point on the quiz means that you failed the quiz. So that's just one data one datum, okay, it's one piece of information. Because you got one point on one quiz, it doesn't make you a bad student. Not yet, but if you got 14 out of 15, again 14 out of 15, then 24 out of 25, okay? If you got all excellent scores on each quiz and midterm, then we can say with a good degree of reliability, it's a piece of information. The information is you're a good student, okay? So information, a good student or a failing student, okay? And a good student means most of the exams are very high, okay? Consistently high performance. And a bad student will mean a consistently failing student. Student, okay? 
a good piece of information, a good piece of data is on Tuesday we had very few customers, okay? But a good information will be on Tuesdays we always have very, very, very few customers. So we don't need as many waitresses, we don't need as many cooks, okay? We don't need as many employees because Tuesdays are always slow, okay? Or maybe because Tuesdays are always slow, you're gonna make a price special. Uh, now, one of my good friends in here, uh, he lives in Kamala Beach, calls me every Wednesday, so tomorrow he's gonna call me, hey man, let's go to a movie. It's a movie night, right? Movie night means what? Price, because Wednesday is always the weakest day for movie theaters. Well, it just happens to be. The movie theater lowers the price almost half. So they offer almost half price. And guys like him that are cost conscious will not want to pay 200 for a regular ticket. Will go for 100, okay? So he always tries to go on Fridays, oh, sorry, on Wednesdays to get the Wednesday movie special price, okay, half price. All right, so that's an example of how if you have a good management information system to tell you that Wednesdays are usually weak, you can provide or you can make a Wednesday special price offer and you could be attracting a lot of people with it. And see, I'm not, well, not going anymore to movie theaters and I wouldn't go, but it's my friend says, hey, we have a movie special, they got this great movie, you want to come over? And here's how one guy brings two more customers in the movie theater, say, okay, it's a special, it's got a price, okay, I'll go to the deal, right? So here's an example where the difference between data, which is just one piece of uh, a specific number and information. Okay, and a system. What does it mean a system? MIS, Management Information System. So, I first explain information. Then, the management means it's for managerial purposes. And the managerial purposes are basically decision making. It's the same old stuff that we've been covering this course, which is planning, organizing, leading, and Okay. So, you want to use the management information system for all functions, but especially for control purposes. And finally, we get to the word system. And system implies and means uh, order. It means there is a specific order, there is a specific structure, and there is a specific arrangement and specific purpose. So, you have a particular structure with a particular purpose, okay? And usually the management information system in modern days is based on computers, computer software, databases, and reports run off or from the database system. And I worked three, four years with management information systems. And one special type of a management information system is called customer relationship database, customer relationship system, CRS. And a customer relationship is what a hotel would usually like to have and like to need. It is is a, spe a special type of a system which focuses specifically on your customers who they are, how much they spend, what type of products they use, and when and how often. And you already have their information, you probably already have their credit card, and their ID, and maybe even their picture and all the other things. So, focus on the customers. Originally, management information systems emerged out of two different fields. One is the accounting field in trying to keep accounting electronic and the other is the customer area, customer relationship area in trying to keep 
important and cr critical information about customers. And now, management information systems are trying to in integrate all major areas of a business, which will include also suppliers, which will include also production or manufacturing, of course, accounting, of course, finance. It's going to also include sales, it's going to include marketing. So a comprehensive management information system will try to cover all fundamental areas of, uh, of the business. Uh, let's see what else we have here today. Let's just say uh, very quickly uh, what is the goal or the purpose. And the goal is very simple. Get the right information at the right time to the right person, basically to the right manager, in order to make good decisions. So, the right information at the right time to the right person. Okay. You need all three. It's no good if you get the wrong information. Also, you may have the perfect information, but you don't need it one or two years later. You need it when you make decisions, okay? You need it at the right time. And just because some employee has the information is no good. The information has to be in the hands of decision makers. So, right information at the right time to the right person for decision making purposes. That's what an MIS, Management Information System, is supposed to deliver. All right, so what I was also explaining is, and that's what I'm also sometimes trying to do on the exam, uh, and I'll clarify this, is called relevant information. And I'm trying to provide examples of irrelevant information. Uh, irrelevant information, okay? You got a white jacket. Is it true? Perfectly true. Is it relevant? Does it matter? No. Okay? I'm holding a pen. Is it true? Yeah. Does it matter? No. Okay? Uh, yeah, it's 2 o'clock in 5 minutes. 2 o'clock in 4 minutes, right? Does it matter? Well, not now, not at the moment. It is irrelevant inter information. Uh, yeah, almost every morning here, the sun shines at 6 o'clock in 5 minutes in the morning, right? and sets at 7 o'clock in the evening. This is all irrelevant information. It is information which is correct, but not very important. Not important for making decisions, okay? And that's what is expected from you on your exam. When I'm asking you, uh, uh, when I'm asking you a specific question, you need not just to answer and give me a correct answer, but you also need to give me the relevant answer. Okay? Because it's very easy to give to memorize a correct answer. But something because it's correct doesn't make it relevant. Okay? For example, we can say assets are on the left side of the balance sheet and liabilities are on the right side of the balance sheet. Perfectly correct. But an accounting is not good enough. I want to know what are the assets, what are the long-term assets, the short-term assets, what are the long you know, I need to know the specific information which is relevant in this case for the business. Okay? So relevant information is more than simply something which an information which is correct. It is something that you actually need, which is important, and on which you're gonna point to base to make a good decision. All right. So today we use to protect information. So we have uh, information protection. We use technologies uh, such as security, logins, passwords, data encryption. I'm not going to be covering any of this. And very important part is data backup. 
it will be a terrible for you to have a business, your little restaurant or hotel to have some information system, and then something happens and you lose your data. Well, somebody just comes and steals the computer, and then you lost all of your data. So you need some form of data backup. You also need some form of a data encryption. And data encryption means that the information can be accessed only if it is, if the person has the right password, the right, the right data encryption password, or the data encryption coding and decoding, okay? Encoding and decoding. But right, you want to protect your information, uh, especially if you're, let's say, a large five-star hotel, okay? If you're a big, reputable business, you'll have to protect your information. Uh, businesses will also use firewalls. You're a younger generation. You should know a lot more about uh, uh, computers. And a firewall is basically a protection of your internal information system from external uh, intrusion. The firewall, this stuff is on page 380, if you look at page 380. So that's number two. So first area I discussed was finance, and the two major tools were rational analysis and logical analysis. The second major area was information, different types of information, uh, then information systems and data protection. And now the last piece is what is called a balanced scorecard. And balanced scorecard is basically approach to try to evaluate your business and try to evaluate your business performance based on financial information. So you use financial information, but financial information is only finance. And then you use customer information, okay? Number three is internal processes. You evaluate your internal process internal process. What is your process when a customer comes and you have a specific process in the hotel from the door where you got the bellboy to carrying the luggage to showing them the room to them getting in the room to showing them how to use the internet, how to use the air conditioner, how to use whatever else is in the room to introducing them the swimming pool, the spa center, and all the other things. Basically, you need a simple, straightforward process. And then process for ordering, if they want to order food, and how you charge them. And then your process for how you collect the money, how you collect the payment, okay? Do you get a deposit? If you get a deposit, how and when do you return the deposit? In other words, what's your process A checkout? When the customer checks out, you first check the room, you see what's going on, if you see the TV is broken and all the other, you know, whatever damage may be in the room. Okay, well, who's gonna check the room? So, you will have specific processes, whether the process is check-in process or a check-out process, or if it's a restaurant, it's gonna be an order process. So, you will evaluate, again, repeating, number one, financial, number two, customer information, number three, internal processes, and number four is going to be employees, people. I mean, are your people good? Are your people motivated? Are your people well educated? Are your people trained? Are they good to do what they're doing? Uh, we were talking about experience uh, and specifically about the camera. The first time you sit on the camera, you're always, you're not sure, you're a little bit maybe scared, you don't know what to do, right? But the second time is easy, all right? And we said that you're experienced, okay? So, you want to know, are your people experienced? Now, if it's a camera, it may take two or three times to get a good enough experience. But if you're an accountant, accountant needs maybe five or 
10 years of experience in order to become good or well experienced, okay? Now, I mean, he's not going to get accountant just with two quarterly reports, okay? He's not going to get a good experienced accountant in six months, okay? So, uh, you want to evaluate how good are your people. You want to evaluate your human resources. You may, but not necessarily, want to evalu evaluate your innovation process if your business needs or requires innovation. But let's say a restaurant doesn't need much of an innovation, okay? It's not Apple, you're not Sony, okay? Sony needs a lot of innovation. Just a little restaurant doesn't need a lot of innovation. A little hotel doesn't need a lot of innovation. Sorry, innovation. But it needs good people. It needs the human resource. Okay? So, this is what a balanced scorecard is. It's a way to evaluate organizational or business performance based on these four fundamental criteria that I gave you. You can use it to evaluate a hotel, a restaurant, a university, uh, a sports facility, uh, anything that you want, any type of business or any type of organization you can use to evaluate. Okay, and it will basically, uh, when you have this type of business, you will focus more on one of these. You may focus more on people, or you may focus more on finance, or you may focus more on customers, and that will depend on your main strategy. All right, so financial control, controlling information I covered, balance scorecards, you got the slide over here, the financial, the customer side, the internal processes, and the people, innovation, maybe, maybe not, and of course, growth prospects and growth assets. So, it evaluates these four fundamental areas of company performance. So that's how you evaluate company as in business, okay? Next one is section four of contemporary issues. And contemporary issues aren't very many, at least we don't need very many. The contemporary issues we cover are here, today in this course, are basically two. Number one, and that's been going on throughout this whole course for practically every single chapter. Number one is cross-cultural differences. At least you've got at least some exposure to Western people, how we think, okay, how we think, how we behave, how we analyze. Again, it doesn't matter. That, that I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's exposure. You get to learn. You also have a few of them right behind you, okay? Students, right? You see them, right? The two guys also coming from Europe, yeah? All right, so cross-cultural differences you should be aware of. Of course, Japanese are also very different. Of course, Americans are very different. But of course, Chinese are very different. But you have major similarities with, with what we call Western culture. Like Americans and Europeans aren't that too much different. I mean, of course, you have differences. They're small. They're minor. We're all based on Western culture and Western Civilization, we call it Greco Roman civilization, okay? Or Jude Judeo Christian beliefs. Okay, and the other one is workplace concerns. Let's see what we got about, uh, what we got about cultural differences. Alright, so cultural differences, of course, uh, uh, will affect control. Control in the West will be sometimes very different from control in the East, okay? So here, now, I got to implement, well, next semester, a control system of attendance. Because students don't come to class. I mean, <laughs> right? Uh, apparently, the grade is not enough. It's like 
failure is not uh, you know, you, it's, it's like kids, you're not afraid from failure, right? Like I'm having 45 out of 50 students in accounting fail, and that's okay. You, we need babysitting where, you know, I will have to take attendance every time of every student, okay, and send you warning and tell you going to fail the course, okay? Well, we don't do this in the West, okay? That's not necessary in the West. Okay, so here is a simple control feature. Also, in the West, and we were talking with some of the guys over there, uh, we just have two exams. You got a midterm and a final, and that's the end of it. And the midterm is 50%, final is 50%, maybe midterm 40%, final 60%, and that's it. There's no quiz one, quiz two, quiz three. Students know they have to study, and they know that they will fail, okay? And in a good university, they know you fail in two courses, you're out, okay? And you find yourself another university, all right? So, there is a different type of, in this case, discipline in the West from the East, okay? Now, on the other hand, from the other hand, Western people uh, like free riding, what I discussed last time, social loafing. So you need more control in the West, where you got a, a, a group, to make sure that some people are not shirking, okay? Here in Asia, at least, people are more socially oriented, they're more group oriented, and they will be contributing more to, to the overall team. So different cultures will sometimes require different control systems, okay? So different cultures require different control systems. And you need to control differently Western professors over here from, let's say, local professors over here. You'll need a different control system, okay? Just because of thinking, culture, mentality, and all the other things. Let's see what else. Uh, another issue besides cultural control system is distant control system. Uh, where you have, let's say, you have, let's say, a five-star hotel, you will have international employees in there, okay? You may have, let's say, when I worked uh, in Macau, you will have a lot of the security people will be from Nepal. They're going to be Nepali guys. You need one type of control system because they have one way of thinking. You're also going to have a lot of Indians working in there. Now, receptions, receptionists will be mainly from Philippines. They're going to be hiring mostly Filipinos, occasionally a Filipino, to do that. So you're going to need a little different system for that part. So for the reception, they're also actually going to have a mixed team. You're going to have a local Macau people. Yeah, they're going to be hiring sometimes Chinese and they're going to be hiring Filipinos, okay? So you also need some language. Of course, the Filipinos will cover the English language, okay? And the local Chinese and Macau people will cover the Chinese language. But the point is, you may need a little bit of a difference within the control system where you have a mixed team, okay? Let's see what else. Now, if you got a distant, you got a five-star, let's say a chain of five-star hotels, and you got a five-star hotel in another town or in another country, now you have to have what's called a distant control. How do you control them from a distance? And usually a distance control will require more formal reporting, more formal reporting. So you're going to require from them give us a more formal report of your operation. So, your headquarters, but you also could have another hotel in another town, it's a hotel chain, you will usually want or need a formal report. Let's see, let, let's see, see what else. Oh yeah, another major difference which is not associated specifically with the culture, which is associated specifically with technologically advanced versus technologically developing, you will have a little bit different systems of control in a highly advanced, technologically advanced society. You 
give them a little bit more independence and they can do whatever they want to do. But in a highly advanced society, for example, you will just keep track of their computer network uh, activity. You will keep track of how much they access Facebook, okay? How much they watch YouTube, okay? So you're not going to be watching them personally, but they will know that they are watched and they will self-control. They will impose on themselves internal discipline because they know they're going to be watched. Uh, yeah, when I was teaching in Taiwan, you got in every classroom, oh, well, in, the, in, in, in all the corridors, you got a camera. And everybody knows there is a camera, okay? So, when you have the camera, maybe it's recorded, maybe it's not recorded. But, you don't want to do anything wrong because you're going to get in trouble. And if you're in trouble and recorded on trouble, then you're in serious trouble. All right? They're just going to throw you out, okay? So, a control system in an advanced society will be a little bit different than it. Now, in the UK, I don't know how it's going on in, uh, in Germany, but I know that uh, UK is now turning into a police nation where they got almost 100,000 cameras everywhere, on every crossroad, on every traffic light, on every street. You got cameras, they record everything, every motion, everything about everyone, everyone's actions, okay? Now in my own country, Bulgaria, we're installing cameras only on traffic lights, okay? Well, if you got the camera on the traffic light, you know that drivers are a lot more disciplined. When the light turns red, they will not go on red because the camera will capture them. You got the cameras coming in here in Phuket? The traffic light? All right, well, you got So, if you got the, uh, the camera, you're going to be a lot more careful. Okay? So, the point I'm trying to make is that technologically advanced societies will impose these types of controls, which effectively impose self-control. If you know your internet activity is being tracked and watched, okay, you won't be spending as much time on YouTube at work. And you won't be spending as much time on Facebook at work, okay? And you won't be, and if you know that in the corridors or somewhere else you got recorded, you won't be talking bad stuff if it's recorded. Or you won't be doing bad things if they can see what you're doing at the moment, okay? So, that makes a big difference in terms of how you control with technology, where people impose self-control on themselves, okay? Uh, in less advanced societies or in developing societies, you will more use direct control and direct supervision. And direct supervision means that the boss is right around, walking, watching, and looking, okay? So, you have a restaurant, usually the restaurant manager will be around, is gonna be looking who's doing what, okay? So, you will have the method of control is called direct supervision. The guy is there, he's basically looking who's doing what and how. Let's see what else we got. Uh, and facing controlling the workplace. Okay. Now about uh, workplace, uh, let's see. Uh, I've already discussed uh, about employers watching their employees. I mean, you got different problems with ethics. Is it ethical? Is it not ethical? I mean, the employers gonna will do whatever is necessary to protect themselves. Okay. I mean, is it ethical to have, uh, let's say, camera in the toilet? Well, you're laughing, <laughs> but 
You're laughing because you can't. In America, you have in the toilets. Now, what about, it's called a change room. You know what's a change room? Change room is, uh, for example, got a sports facility, fitness or a swimming pool. You go there, you get naked, and you put your swimming in a track suit, okay? And then you go exercise. When you finish, you get your clothes off. You take a shower, right? And then you put your back, work clothes back, and you go back to work, okay? Well, guess what? You're laughing again, right? There are cameras there watching you while you're changing your clothes. All right? Now, terrible or not terrible? Again, depends on the culture, right? Well, they just do it in America, whether you like it or don't like it. If you don't like it, don't go there, right? Don't go take a shower. Don't go to the swimming pool if you don't like it, right? Right? And that's it. Yeah, you don't, if you don't like camera in the toilet, so don't go to the toilet. Oh, you don't like too many cameras in your workplace? Just leave the job. We're going to hire somebody else, okay? If you don't like, leave, okay? We're going to find somebody else who doesn't mind or, or who needs the money says, okay, camera or no camera, I need to work, okay? All right, so this is already happening in, in America. It is happening in many, many workplaces in the United Kingdom, and it's slowly and steadily moving around the world, okay? Now, when I was, when I was uh, uh, teaching in Taiwan, the campus had a simple policy. We are trying to cover every corner of the university campus with camera. We got 1,000 cameras, and we're proud of it. All right, we're technologically advanced. We're watching you every little turn. Now, I don't know if they had them in, in the toilet, but they sure had them in every single room, in every classroom, and in the dorm, right, where the dorm were they, they got a camera there, okay? What do I do now? So, again, it is already happening, okay? It is in many advanced parts of the world already happening. And just because it's not happening here doesn't mean it's not happening in other parts of the world, okay? So that's well, more like ethical issues, but it's just business. That's how business is run these days in the United States. Another one is watching YouTube activity. Basically, the employer will have, uh, let's say, uh, uh, some sort of a filter, and if you're watching YouTube more than 15 minutes, you're in trouble, okay? So that's so. Now, some other employers, what they will do is, what they'll do is they'll say, we just block YouTube, and you cannot even access YouTube. Now, some employers already block Facebook, because employees are spending way too much time playing Facebook, right? Instead of actually working. So, you have all of these issues associated with uh, with, uh, you know, employees playing or working and whatnot. Also, of the workplace, you need to worry about employee theft, and we discussed last time. You know, what's to prevent the employee at the end of classes to go grab the big clock, you know, the clock behind there, put it in their bag, right? Like, I'm having a bag over here, right? This is the bag which I'm using for the camera. And as I walk, I just grab the clock and put it in here, okay? What's to prevent me to do that? Do you understand? This is employee theft. It's taking property from the employer without the employer's authorization, without being authorized, without permission, okay? Because the employer may give you a laptop with a clear understanding that you can take the laptop home as long as you bring it back tomorrow to work, okay? You have the employer's permission. But in this case, you don't have the permission. Well, what's to prevent someone from just taking, you know, this little thing, right, the microphone, right, microphone, put it in the pocket and go home with it, okay? So, that's the one type. It is property theft, but you may also have data theft or information theft. How do we prevent employees from getting that nice database of customers and going to another hotel and saying, look guys, I got 1,500 customers.
customer list, and I got their addresses, their emails, and everything else, and I'll sell it to you for $10,000 or twenty or whatever the amount is, okay? How about that? All right, so you need to worry about protecting the workplace, all right? Protecting the workplace from theft, whether it's the property or information. Uh, yeah, you need to protect the workplace from people making fraudulent expense reports and we call it embezzlement. Let's try. Uh, anyone, guys? Uh, dictionary, iPhone, dictionary, embezzle and translate. Im -be I think that was embezzlement. Okay, translate embezzlement in your local Thai language to embezzle uh, is basically to try to steal money out of the company. You got it, Gautam? Well, what is it? Can you read for everyone? Loud, loud, I, I, we can't hear. You understand? Okay, so you guys understand what's embezzlement, okay? So, uh, you, you, you have, you know, that sometimes they say, okay, we went to this hotel and in this hotel we spent money, this and this, and they provide fraudulent receipts. They never spent the money. They took the money and put the money in their pocket. Okay, that's embezzlement of company funds. So, you need to worry about company funds, about company information, about company property, whether it's simple markers, whether it's scissors, whether, whether it's little company phones, or just stealing the company laptop, all right? You need to worry about all of this. Uh, sometimes employees do it because everyone else is, and why would employees steal? Because everyone else is stealing and it's okay. Uh, sometimes people or employees will steal because it's not a big deal. I mean, here's the question. Is it a big deal if I just steal this and I just take it home to use at home? Is it a big deal? I mean, it's, 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 it's already in my pocket and I just go home and say, oh, I got this, okay? Is it a big deal? I mean, how much does it cost? It's like nothing. All right. So sometimes employees will still, and they say, well, it's a small thing anyway. It's not going to hurt the company, right? I mean, uh, the, the university is buying 10,000 every semester, okay? And if I steal one or two, no big deal, right? Uh, all right, the same thing with coffee. They got coffee, they got tea, and I can get one piece of tea, right? One piece of tea is one buck, okay? Two cents, three American cents. It's cheap, it's nothing, right? But can I just get a tea and say, well, huh, yeah, they, 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 they got a lot anyway, right? But well, here's something else that they got a lot. Tiny little bottles of water. I mean, they got like thousands in the office. If I just take one and instead of drinking it, just take it home, is this a theft? Is it a big deal? Well, that's what I'm trying to explain is that a lot of employees think that it's because a small thing it doesn't really matter, and it's not going to hurt the employer anyway. Now, sometimes employees will steal because they think the employer is making way too much money. They're getting way too rich. So, if they steal the laptop, yeah, no big deal. Or, okay, it's not going to hurt them. Or, well, they're making too much money anyway. Okay, I deserve a little tiny little piece of the pie. All right, so these are examples of different reasons of how employees would think to steal property from the company, okay? And it can happen in a restaurant, right? I mean, in a restaurant, you got it, and the waitress will just take one Coke and take the Coke home, right? A can of Coke, I mean, no big deal, right? I mean, it's cheap anyway, right? Well, but they can do it on a regular basis, okay? <laughs> and they got, you know, one waitress doing it every day, and suddenly, uh, you know, 30 cokes are missing. And they got 10 waitresses, and suddenly 300 cokes are missing, okay? And 300 cokes and 
for a small restaurant is not a small amount for a small restaurant. It's a, it's a big one. Or, you know, the cook is cooking and, you know, is cooking instead of, uh, let's say, 10 kilos of meat. He, you know, cuts a little piece, half a kilo, and takes it home to cook for his wife, right? I mean, she deserves a little piece of meat, a uh, piece of meat too, right? Right? She, she deserves or doesn't deserve? His wife deserves a piece of meat too? No, the answer is yes, she deserves it, but because she deserves it doesn't mean you have to steal it from the company to give it to her, okay? We just say, hey, boss, you got half a kilo, you know, I'll pay you whatever the price is, and you take it home, okay? Or the boss will say, okay, I'll give you 50% off, okay? It's the, you know, the, the key difference is the theft, stealing part, okay? You actually deserve nothing wrong with it. Okay. And you have a lot of problems, at least in the U.S. and in the U.K. These are different problems. Uh, I'm pretty much ready to, to, to finish for today with workplace violence. Let's see if we got, okay, challenging and controlling the workplace. You see the eye here? It's the camera and the eye is watching you, right? At all times, everywhere. Employee theft, and these are controlling employee theft. Yeah, that will be a good question for the final exam is, what are some major methods to control employee theft? That's slide number 25. And you see here, right, careful pre-hiring screening. So, when you're hiring, you're careful who you are hiring so that you don't hire a criminal, okay? Um, you establish specific policies defining theft. You explain to them what is a theft. For example, when I came here, nobody explained to me whether taking a marker home is a theft or not. All right, is it a theft or not a theft? Well, well, yeah, we somehow understand it is, but what is, it is a good policy that every time they begin, you explain to them what is a theft, you explain to them what is a fraud, okay? And you make it clear. You can, you, you steal a spoon, right, which is dirt cheap, then you're gonna be fired, okay? So, it's nice for them to have clear policy and explain to them, okay? Also, you involve employees in writing policies. If they will write the policy, they will know it and they will understand it. All right, you educate them and train them about the policies. So, you will have a special training, maybe two hours on protecting the workplace property, whether it's information, whether it's data, whether it's just chairs and the clocks and the laptops and whatever else. You just explain to them. All right. Well, maybe you guys don't need to do this because you guys in Thailand don't steal much, right? Supposedly, you're a very, very, very low crime country, right? Crime here is a little, little problem, practically not a problem. Uh, but, uh, let's say you go some countries in Europe, especially Eastern Europe, uh, and you leave your motorcycle, your little scooter, you leave it on the street, you go to eat in the restaurant, when it come back, sorry, it's gone, meaning it's stolen, okay? Same thing happens with bicycles. So, in some countries, and some, yeah, I was, yeah, I was just talking to one of the professors here in China, he says, oh, no, 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 in China, you cannot leave your motorcycle. You get a motorcycle, you better lock it real well, otherwise it's gonna get stolen. Here in Thailand, you can leave the motorcycle for three days, no one's going to steal it, but over there they can steal it fairly quickly. Same thing is in my home country. You, know, you can't just leave your motorcycle at night outside. You know, they're just going to steal it. Okay? So, uh, again, the point is different cultures, people have different, it's called proclivity or tendency to steal. And you got to be careful about it. What else? You have professionals review our internal security controls. Security, especially for theft, needs, requires professionals. 
So from time to time, you may want to have someone, you know, who will, for example, we have a hotel, but they, you know, and the hotel's got a laundry. And the housewife will take a little, uh, you know, the laundry powder, okay, which you use for laundry, she takes some the laundry powder home, right? And she's doing laundry home, right? So these are simple little things, but sometimes you need to have control. And you got some concurrent controls, you keep them with respect and dignity, okay? You openly communicate costs of stealing, all right? So you can see on a regular basis there's successes in preventing it theft and fraud, okay? Sometimes you may have to catch somebody and you may have to fire them in front of the whole company so that the company, everyone else understands. We will be dealing radically with theft, okay? So we got all of these little policies over here, uh, which is a good question for the final grade. For example, it could be, well, a little hotel or a little restaurant, which will be some of the ways, some of the feed forward, concurrent, concurrent or feedback methods to control employee theft, for example. And the last piece which I went up to, it should be the very last one, yes, is workplace violence. Now, here in Thailand, they have a lot of workplace violence where people start fighting or they bring a gun and start shooting each other. Now, in the U.S., you got a lot of these problems, okay? Here, I've never heard. Do you have or don't have here? Things like that. Probably not, okay? You guys have or don't have? Workplace violence. You know, guys starting and fighting and all the other things. You don't have, right? No, well, okay, let, let, let me tell the story. Uh, when I was in Bahrain, okay, and we actually got for one hour, we got a security training, okay, on security and stuff like that. And the chief of security came to, you know, all of us, all of employees, and was explaining to us about different, you know, what happens in case of fire, what happens in case of earthquake, what happens in case of this, if a gunman comes. And then we'll get to the point of explaining about fighting, where, you know, two or three guys will get into a vicious fight. Does it happen? And he says, well, it actually happens, and it always happens for one reason. Two guys will always get in a fight because of a girl or for a girl, okay? So you need to be watching the girls because guys fight usually between two guys or whatever they happen. And so it's a very, he, he said, the, we've never had uh, any kind of a violence on the workplace except two guys fighting for a girl. I mean, no one came with a gun. No one came with a gun to come and, sit and steal money from the cash register. Okay, there was never any kind of violence except two guys fighting for a girl. All right? So, you need to understand the type of violence. Now, why in the U.S. they have so much more violence than in other places, okay? Well, a number of reasons. Number one, Americans are a lot more aggressive culture. But aggressive doesn't necessarily mean violent, using fist guns or knives, okay? That's a whole different story. But the problem with Americans is that uh, they are on way too many pills, on way too many medications. Medications which alter their mind. They are on antidepressants. Uh, also, a lot of the problems of violence are associated with food and diet. You eat bad food, okay, and you eat unhealthy food, and your body becomes dysfunctional, but your brain becomes dysfunctional too. So, in the United States, is the leading country in the world of psychiatric diseases, okay? And a lot of people are on psychiatric pills. In these psychiatric pills, they change your brain functioning, brain, how your brain works in things, and sometimes there will be inhibitors that will inhibit your self-control. Just like you may probably know. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about this. Uh, when I was when I was in Bahrain, okay, and you got big parties, you got big Filipino parties, okay, you got big Thai parties, 
Right. I mean, you will have thousands of Thai people working in Bahrain, okay? And guess what? Every time at the end of the party, these Thai guys get into a fight. Well, not necessarily for a girl. Usually they get into a fight because they already had a few drinks. They already had a few drinks, and some of them had a little bit of Muay Thai, right? Thai boxing, and they start showing off to each other some moves. The problem we call it here is inhibition. Inhibition is how you self-control your behavior. And people, men and women, lose inhibition after they have a few drinks. When they get a little drunk, it's very easy to get into a fight. It's not just Thai people, it's Americans, it's Europeans, it's Bulgarians. Any country, you know, you get alcohol, alcohol, it, it, you know, blocks your inhibiting center of the brain, and you get more loose. You start talking louder, you start talking stupid stuff, you start getting, you know, you know what drunk people do. Well, one of the things they do is get into a fight, okay? Well, that's what alcohol does. Alcohol blocks inhibiting centers of the brain and you lose self-control. Well, a lot of psychiatric drugs do exactly the same. They block some of these centers and the people are a lot more, they don't think it's a big deal to get the gun and shoot five or ten people, right? Especially if they hurt you. All right. So that happens a lot. But well, what, what happens is the company sends somebody home and say, okay, you're fired, we don't need your... And the guy uh, goes home, gets the gun, and comes back to work and shoots everybody, right? If they could. So you have these type of... Uh, and you have certain uh, workplace violence. Uh, maybe I will not be asking about violence for you. That's not as relevant over here, right? Not unless you get drunk. Yeah? All right, so uh, violence, I won't be teaching too much. I'm just, uh, I just gave you a few examples. You can read a lot more. They're like two or three, two or three pages over here. Now, you may have another type of violence, like uh, not really violence, but nuisance. Someone talking with a loud voice, okay? Sometimes they realize, sometimes they don't realize. Okay, uh, so they disturb other employees to the point where it makes them really angry. Okay, someone teasing the other worker to the point where the other worker just gets angry and tries to, you know, hit him with a fist right? because you're he's you you're trying to, you know, make him bad. Okay, you're enticing him. Okay. So, you may have some of these uh, problems. Sometimes the boss is going to be so bad, the boss is going to be yelling and screaming and doing all the terrible things and the employee is all the time like this and sometimes the employee says, next time I'm going to smash him, but I'm going to smash him so that, you know, I'm going to break half of his teeth, right? He's going to do it one time. And he's going to do it with a hammer to make sure that he breaks close to you know, a lot of things and, and bones, right? Happens in Germany? No. Oh, sometimes, maybe. All right. So you yeah, have different types and forms of violence, but I'm not going to be, that, that's not part of what we're trying to teach in this course, okay? In this course, we're trying to teach the basics of management, and that's way too, yeah, that's a major current issue in US, major current issue, let's say, in, uh, in the UK, and probably in the West. Now, if you're in some other countries, modern issues will be mafia, right? Yakuza, if you're in Japan, right? The Japanese mafia. Okay. In China, you got to be dealing with the Chinese triads. It's a current issue. Current issue of modern Chinese management is dealing with mafia, which is the triad, and dealing with the Communist Party and the government. All right. So, in different countries, you will probably have very different current issues related to the, in general, to control and to workplace. 
And as far as I'm concerned, with this, the whole course and all the lectures are complete. Thank you, guys. Amen.